Hello and welcome to the second ever Brex Box. Yay! <laughs> Download the podcast and subscribe on YouTube. And if you missed the first one, what have you been doing? <laughs> Thousands have subscribed already, but please keep clicking. We want to be bigger than news night. Yay! Cheers, guys. Yay! Yay! Bigger news night. <laughs> So, Alex, you were supposed to be on the first Brex box. Where were you? <laughs> Where was I indeed? Well, we were sitting in the Parliament and we were having the um, President of the Parliament's elections, which you all know was stitched up. Yep. And they started calling out names for the MEPs pulled out of a hat to be the tellers, to, to count the votes and oversee the uh, process. And both Henrik and I, good old, uh, the, the Great Dane, Henrik and I were both selected as tellers, which was pretty crazy. A quarter of the people running that election were from the Brexit party. <laughs> so I, I was basically locked in a dungeon with <laughs> ushers in their crazy uniforms, counting bits of paper and standing next to a ballot box and having Manfred Weber and Giva Hofstadt coming and voting. And I had to say, can I check your badge, sir? Write your name down. And But what a joke that was. Yeah. Well, we certainly made an impact, though. I mean, I love that photo of you, Alex, in the Parliament <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. with the flag. <laughs> I mean, no one can deny that the Brexit Party MEP certainly made our presence felt in the first week. Oh. And they called you a football hooligan or you, you, you know, a like forward for yeah. a football team. And well, within minutes. I was sitting there. We had our earphones on. They called Henrik's name. We were all like, whoa, that was mad. You know, that's utterly crazy. Then when they said my name, because there's another MEP with my name, I was just like, oh, it'll be her. Is that from the Greens? Uh, from the Greens, yeah. yeah. Um, when they called my name, I sort of just sat there and Nigel turned around and he's like, get up, get up, what are you doing? And for some reason, in the moment, I just picked up the Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, the whole thing, that, that entire ballot, of mm. course, on the Monday night, before that ballot was taking place, the next president of the European Parliament, news came in late at night that mm. the powers that be behind closed doors had stitched up the big job. They'd mm. stitched up the, the commission president, the mm. ECB... Um, the, the, the next leader of the council. And so the chap who got it in the end on the ballot, because loads of other candidates were forced to withdraw, was a sop to Italy, really, to say, well, you know, you're not allowed in the big boys club with the real jobs, but here you go, you can, you can stand as the president of the parliament. So it was stitched up. And in terms of, I mean, in terms of the proposed new EU commission president, of course, this Ursula von der Leyen, sort of German defence minister, very interesting. She comes with a strong recommendation. In fact, there was a poll done in Germany and only 33% of the German people think she'll be any good. A majority don't. Yeah. So there's your endorsement. <laughs> I mean, they're not exactly putting their best up for the European Union, but this seems to be the way they're doing it. And also, I do think it's significant, the fact that she's the German defence minister. I think mm. that shows clearly, and we've heard it from Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel, full EU army, that's what they're focused on, and that's, I think, why they're Absolutely. trying to bring her in. But what was really fascinating, though, is, is that finally, even the independent back in the UK and the, the, the parliamentarians within the MEPs here start saying, hang on a minute, this isn't a democracy. What's going on? This isn't what we voted for. Precisely what the Brexit party has been saying since the very beginning, we're starting to see that the ripples are going out. So that once we shine a light on the inner machinations of yeah. this, this machine, mm. then we are seeing that, 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 that it is undemocratic. Mm. It is a cut-up. It's, it's a backroom Brussels carve-up. Mm. Just as Nigel said, this isn't conspiracy theory. It's happening in plain mm. sight. Mm. And the whole media, the whole world is watching. Mm. Yes, I mean, were you surprised by the reaction that after the last Xbox we had that sitting in Parliament and the backlash? Yeah, I, I think it was amazing. And, and interestingly, when you're actually in the Parliament, you can see how people yeah. respond to it. We don't get mm. to see that on the TV mm. back home. You know, people were not happy with the way that things were playing out there. Yeah. You know, what's happened is, is that, you know, Brexit didn't only break politics, it's broken the media. And I think it's particularly broken the mainstream media's stranglehold on how news is disseminated. And the reaction to Brexbox itself has been fascinating. Oh, it's been wonderful. Yeah, because we've said I've for ages, it. right, it's like, hey, look, we can't get a fair showing elsewhere. Yeah. We're going to make our own TV yeah, channel. Absolutely. And so that's what Brexbox is. And my favourite tweet, there's lots of feedback to this, but I had to draw attention to uh, Mr Oliver King, who's the head of content at Channel 4. He wasn't happy. No, no. at ITN. And he's saying, um, this, this was shot using Euro European parliamentary staff in the European Parliament's online radio studio, which is free of charge. <laughs> it's actually not free of charge. It's paid for by European taxpayers. And, of course, his tweet went absolutely viral. Mad. A whopping... 
four retweets, the power of the mainstream media on show yet again. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, these facilities, the ones we're using now, are paid for yeah. by European taxpayers. And let's not forget, 17.4 million people who voted to leave are part of the taxpayer mm. system mm. who's affording this. So, actually, for the first time, hopefully, they're getting some valuable returns on course, their money. Yeah, and, of course, that includes over 600,000 people in my region, the east of England. No party before, since 1999, since the, uh, the constituency was set up, got over 600,000 votes. And I like to think that they sent me here uh, with a very clear mandate to, to, to promote Brexit and, and stand up as MEPs. And I think with Brexbox, we're getting the word out there of what we're doing, what we're seeing, all the rest of it. I think it's fantastic. As well. But, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the reaction in Parliament to the stitch-up, the, the mm. president, uh, p parliamentary president election, the announcement of the new commissioner, who we actually have to sort of mandate, or we don't have to... Obviously, we're not going to rubber stamp that. Mm. Don't worry. Mm. Um, but, you know, it gets down to Parliament to either vote in or vote out the new commission. But the reaction was so febrile. It was insane. Yeah. And actually, because yeah. we know the mainstream media in the UK won't report on that. Absolutely not. We've actually cut it into a little montage. So roll VT. One of the presidents in the council uh, would accept this being done in any of their countries. Um, it would be taken to a constitutional court. What we need, first and foremost, is to democratise the process. Well, if we look at this casting exercise, I don't know if we will get the uh, momentum for change that our citizens want to see. This institution is not uh, democratic. By excluding virtually 20% of the members of this European Parliament. I think the most obvious uh, conclusion that comes from the uh, last council is that the Spitzen candidate uh, mechanism is dead. Is dead and gone. It's even more dead than a parrot in a Monty Python sketch. So I find it quite interesting. I've got like this little graphic which helps me find my way around because, you know... <laughs> the organogram. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Most people don't understand how the parliament works, you know, and the whole EU system is structured. So from, you know, the European Court of Justice down to the European Court of Auditors, we've got the European Court of Financial uh, Ministers, we've got the European Parliament. There's just so much of it, so many layers of bureaucracy. A flow flowchart of mediocrity. Yeah, and, I know. And, 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 the organogram and, of doom. <laughs> How many people off of the street would actually understand that or be able to explain that? But this is the thing, of course, you know, people always say that Brexiteers didn't know not what they were voting for when they voted to leave. Mm. I would argue that anyone who voted to remain don't know what they voted for because they didn't know we were going to get Ursula as the next mm. Commission president. Does anyone know her agenda? Does anyone know her five-year plan? Does anyone know what the EU is going what, to do in the next five years? Well, the whole point about her is she was elected without a manifesto. Oh, well, the Brexit party hasn't got a manifesto, people said in response. The point is, she's about to take one of the top jobs in the entire place, right. and literally nobody knows what she stands for, what she was elected upon. So, you know, I was saying on Twitter, Remainers, tell me how this is a good thing. Tell me how you can, you can, you can accept the fact that somebody's got the top job who wasn't on the ballot paper. Explain to me how that's a good thing. Tumbleweed. Yeah. This is the reality <laughs> yeah. of, of the EU, and that's our job. It's our job to come here and shine a light on this yeah. so the wider world gets a grasp of what we kind of already know. Mm. Right, yeah. because by and large, it is an anti-democratic system. The only layer of democracy, arguably, is the European Parliament. That, that's the only bit that's directly elected. And the European Parliament are not happy because their hands have been tied behind their backs mm. by the powers that be, and they have no say whatsoever, really. It's just a rubber-stamping organisation. But reflecting back on that very first Strasbourg, mm. the old travelling circus. So you did a little calculation for the costs, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it's like going through actually one of these uh, reports that was produced by the European Court of Auditors, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they haven't signed off the EU's accounts for... Uh, oh, a long, a long, time. long time. A long, long time. And so I was having a read through... <laughs> Their maths is as good as Diane Abbott <laughs> in this place. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> so I was having a trawl through some of these uh, reports, and uh, I think it was back in 2015, there was a report that was uh, that was issued there that said that if we closed down the parliament in Strasbourg and divested in the buildings there we would save 613 million euros if yeah. you take off the top of that the 114 million that we're spending every year mm. just in getting backwards and forwards to that mm. that's kind of almost a billion euros that could be saved immediately and and it, 
Sorry, I was going to say, it's crazy. When you go to leave Parliament, the MEPs, they run out all at the same time, don't they? As soon as the last vote's done, they are literally like running out of chamber like this, running down to the car reservation centre. And it causes a traffic jam mm. in that whole area. You've got that sort of housing estate by Parliament. And no, they have to shut off all the roads just so the MEPs can go out in their cars. I think my main takeaway, actually, from that first Strasbourg session was the fact that you know, so many people, their argument against the Brexit party was don't vote for the Brexit party MEPs, they won't turn up, they won't do anything. And then we came here with the back turning. And of course, who can forget the explosive, absolute dynamite yeah. Anne Whitty can speak. Whitty. Oh. And so what I think has happened to our opponents is they've gone from saying, well, don't vote for the Brexit party and they're not going to do anything, to actually getting doubly angry <laughs> because <laughs> we're coming. We actually are I mean, doing I mean, this. Can anyone tell me what the Conservative or Labour MEPs did? What are did? they doing? No. I mean, they're not exactly making Brexit I, box, I, that's I didn't even know they were here. And we are <laughs> well, exactly. And they're very easy to miss. But, you know, the Brexit party is here having an impact and I, that's why I really do think Brexit is such a great initiative and yeah. you know long may it continue and yeah. wait for them all to copy us right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but talking about um, the Conservative and the Labour Party yeah. like you were they've been up to stuff in the news yesterday I think yeah. it was you had uh, 30 Tory MPs saying that they're having their secret meetings their little mm. conclaves to say that they're going to um, block no deal being run of course by uh, our, our mate Hammond. Bill Hammond Big Phil. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, what does that tell you? The Tory party, if you, in any future general election, I think we're probably going to end up having one before the end of the year, would be my prediction. A vote for the Conservative Party splits the Brexit vote mm. because the Tories are as divided on this as yeah. Labour. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, a, a perpetual logjam for, for Boris. I mean, how can he get this through on, on the parliamentary majority that he has if he's going to push forward with, with the no-deal Brexit 31st October? If he does, fair play. We'll be out of the job, mm -hmm. but we'll be out of the EU. Mm -hmm. That's why we're Wait. here. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, no, Boris, do it, mate. And please do it. And get it for out, great. But can he deliver? Because Hammond has, has already said 30 of them teeing up you know, to, to block this deal again, to frustrate the Tories again. So what are the chances of this getting through? And blimey, we don't even know the crazy, enormous, powerful things that Change UK are going to do. <laughs> Sorry, who? <laughs> <laughs> who? <laughs> who? No, but I mean, interestingly, I mean, Labour today with some really yeah. major moves as well. It's clear they're going to become a complete second yeah. referendum, remain a party, very, very hard line. I mean, this is the thing that gets me. That is not a moderate view, is it? To no. say we are going to effectively ignore the referendum result, the yep. largest democratic mandate in our country's history, 17.4 yep. million, mm, yep. and, and instead go for a second referendum and, and seek to overturn it by campaigning to stay in. Yes. That is a damn hard, hard line position as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Are they not uh, betraying like five million yeah, of their yeah. own voters? Well, they're betraying do democracy. Well, they're betraying well. actually, yeah, democracy, the entire population, regardless of if you voted yeah. to yeah. leave or remain, you're undermining a democratic ex exercise, one of the biggest yeah. in our history. I, I've got to say, for me, you know, I, I'm a lifelong Labour voter. All of us have had very different journeys, mm -hmm. you know, within the Brexit party to get yeah. to the same kind of end point. And I'm a lifelong Labour voter who, this is a bittersweet moment for me, because on the one hand, you know, Labour has absolutely and finally sold out the working classes, you know, where I'm from, in Nottinghamshire, the coal belts. That's it. Yeah. You know, the unions have abandoned us, Corbyn's abandoned us, Watson's abandoned us. That's... I think a moment of sadness. On the other hand, what a great opportunity for Brexit Party MEPs, MPs, sorry, knocking on doors in the Midlands and the North, getting on late. Labour voters come out. You've been betrayed by the Labour Party. We're the only people that will now enact Brexit. It gives us a clear point of view. I see this as an opportunity for the Brexit Party to, to really drive the stake into these Labour heartlands. They've taken their vote for granted for yeah. generations, generations. Absolutely. They deserve to get it stuffed to them. Mm. Yeah, we really I, do. Think, I think we actually are coming to the end of two-party politics. When you look mm. at the polls, consistently now, Brexit Party leading in the polls. I mean, that's incredible. But for us, it isn't about the propagation and prolongation of our brand. Mm. It's about actually governance, mm. delivering democracy, direct democracy, policy-making bottom-up, mm. and actually as our motto goes, changing politics for good, which I'm, I'm super excited by it. Yeah. We've not made a bad start, have we? Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. We haven't. Not at all. Well, on that note, I actually think we should wrap it up because yeah. we've actually got a meeting to go to, guys. We have yes, again. Uh, yeah. uh, we're off to do our work, off to do our um, very busy jobs as MEPs. So More scheming, more plotting, <laughs> um, and more promises <laughs> to enact the Brexit you voted for. Thanks for watching. We're here working for you guys.
Yeah, so. thank you. And uh, make sure you tune in next time. Please subscribe, yeah. share the link. Let's get people involved. Our aim is to beat Newsnight. Yay. That's our first aim. So, uh, I'll drink to that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you. See you next Cheers. time. All the best. See you next time.